Avanti, I'd like to ask, um, do you have any advice for, um, practical advice for family life? Like, um, how to be a good Buddhist uh, while balancing family commitments? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, well, the um, the model for for life in a, in a relationship or in a family um, is um, of good friendship, what we call kalyana mitata, um, and so seeking to be the good friend to your husband, your children, your parents, um, and encouraging them to be your good friends. And so good friends um, are those that um, help you to see um, or to um, become aware of your blind spots and help you to overcome your weaknesses and your defilements, to give you feedback, um, kindly um, and timely feedback um, and for you to provide that to them. So it's um, helping each other to overcome defilements and to develop in all that is good and wholesome. So this, so it's really tough to do this, um, the, the Buddha's education, um, to let go of defilements, abandon the unwholesome, develop the wholesome, purify the heart. It's so difficult for anyone to do that. And if you uh, can find um, a partner in life who has the same goals and the same aspiration and to be able to help each other um, on that path, then that's a wonderful thing, it's not a bad thing. Um, and to be able to share that and to instill that same um, aspiration um, in your children is a very meritorious thing um, and a beautiful thing. So um, family life um, can, is not necessarily a distraction from Dhamma. Um, it's, uh, it's adding complications and there are a lot more um, temptations to suffer than maybe as a monk, um, but you know, it's taking on this idea of I'm I'm a Buddhist mean I'm a learn I'm learning I'm learning how to be I'm always learning how to be a good daughter to be a wife to be a mother I'm not I'm not a graduate I haven't got this worked out yet I make mistakes but I'm trying to to work on this. So, you know, you don't have to be super mum, you know, and, and uh, make all the right choices. You make mistakes, but it's your, your underlying purity of your intention, which is, in, which is important. Um, generally, in, um, the Buddha pointed to two, two factors in, in relationships and communities. That's a harmony of view and a harmony of sila, of conduct. Um, and these are the most important factors for long-term healthy relationship. So uh, harmony of view, essentially right view, like these kinds of beliefs that I spoke about just now, it doesn't mean that you, uh, you and your husband would have the same understanding and belief and, and uh, opinions on everything, but there is a mutual respect and there's a general harmony between you. Uh, and similarly, an understanding of and a commitment to precepts. So if there's commitment to precepts and same general aspiration and understanding of uh, uh, values of what's right and what's wrong and what's good and, and what's the purpose of our life here as human being, then um, this can be very enriching life in, um, as a household. And so the, <clears throat> I, I'm, something that you know, I think is really important to remember is there's absolutely no doubt that this is the very best time in history ever to be born as a woman. 
absolutely no question. You look at a lot of women in the, in the past, um, there's never have women had the same access to healthcare, to education, uh, to make choices of lifestyle, uh, to get married or not get married, to have children or not get children, um, to work or not work. You have so much um, autonomy and freedom and a choice to make a good life for yourself um, that women have never had this before. So really um, recognize this and, and take advantage of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your excellent sharing and for your compassion in coming back to Singapore again. Uh, Anajan, um, may I know how do you feel when you learn that you, know, you are going to be the um, biographer for you know, the Great Mapocha? And uh, could you give us uh, you know, some preview or some um, interesting uh, experiences that you had you know, when uh, you were actually practicing? Well, I, I was asked to um, to write, or to, in fact, to begin with, it was a kind of a group effort, and then everyone else fell away, and I was the main person in, in writing the Thai biography, the official Thai biography of Lung Po Cha. So I, I really started on this project of writing biography in the late 80s. So it's basically been my whole life, you know, it's part of my, my whole identity is you sort of the, the Ajahn Chah biographer. Um, so, you know, I can't, I can hardly remember a time when I wasn't involved in this in some way or another, in, in some version or other. Um, so I, it's, a, it's a great honor uh, for me and um, as as someone who like from uh, from childhood I, I never really felt at home in in England or in the West and always had an incredible strong um, almost gravitational pull to Asia and originally to to India um, and the moment I can remember the moment I arrived in India I was 17 years old the moment I could possibly leave England I did and uh, I am just feeling this sense of um, joy and homecoming. And, and so I've lived in Asia, you know, more or less, you know, I'm now almost 60 and I've lived in Asia since I was 17. Um, and this is, this is home for me. Uh, and I learned Thai very really, uh, quickly and, and I took to the whole Thai culture and Asian culture and I just, it's, it's what I'm most comfortable in. And, and so, um, in that way, I was kind of like unique amongst the Western monks even, in that almost all of the Western monks have um, eventually felt some pull to go back to propagate Buddhism in their own countries or they've spent many years overseas. And that's never been any interest of mine at all. My interest has been in the, the Theravada Buddhist countries, essentially Thailand, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in Theravada Buddhist culture and, and helping to contribute to it and to protect it and to, um, and to propagate it. Um, and so um, that being the case, given my, my, my commitment to this um, to Thai Buddhism and Thai Theravada tradition and my facility with the language, then, then I was in a kind of a, a, like a unique position amongst all the Western monks to be able to do this work of presenting the teachings of, of Lung Po Cha to the world and I feel um, greatly honored to, to, to have that opportunity. Um, um, so, um, despite the fact that you know, I, I do feel so at home in this part of the world, I do have this sort of a broader um, sense of a broader context than many of the, my Thai colleagues and a more, that kind of more analytical um, mind than is common um, amongst uh, the Thai, Thai bhikkhus. 
and so um, I think that being able to to look at the Ajahn Chah tradition and compare it with other traditions and to try to tease out the the, um, the most salient factors and um, he, um, in a way perhaps that a, a Thai biographer might not have been able to, to, to do. That That's my my hope. So I, I didn't um, <clears throat> spent so much time with Ajahn Chah before he became uh, bedridden and stopped. But um, for me, from the moment I met him, this is incredible faith in him individually and this conviction that um, he was an Arahan and that Arahanship um, is um, possible. Is it, it's it's not something that was um, uh, confined, restricted to the great teachers of old, but um, and of course I'm speaking to someone with that. You know, I didn't have any psychic powers or any ability to really know, but this is this is nature of faith, and and of course at the beginning um, I didn't speak any Thai at all, um, but I was determined to learn. As soon as I could, but I think that in the early days of monastic life, where it's very tough, in, in those days physically it was really demanding. Um, the climate is very difficult. It's very a bit in Singapore, very hot and sticky, um, and um, you're working, uh, you're you're getting up two or three o'clock in the morning and not getting to bed till ten at night. 11 um, and you're living on one meal a day and just generally it's, it's really tough um, and what keeps you going in the beginning is not that you're getting this you know drip drip of incredibly profound teachings but it's seeing someone who's done this training and proved that it works that that's what you need more than anything else um, and this is what great monks like um, Ajahn Chah um, give give to us. Um, like for instance, um, you know the monk that comes here, like Lung Po Liam. I mean, I, I I feel if I if I come into his presence and bow to him and just um, see him sitting there, that's already I don't I don't even you know not so worried about listening to a dhamma talk. It, it's him himself which is. Uh, it's such a wonderful gift to the world. Um, of course, his teachings are wonderful as well. But, but for me, it's just someone who's um, who has made the teachings his own and proved the the the, the efficacy of them and proved that they they really do work. Um, and this is something I found in in Lumpur Cha. So I found it like in writing. Um, in, in a lot of the books um, printed, published on Ajahn Shah, I think you, are, when I say, you always get like a kind of a Walt Disney Ajahn Shah figure. You know, this, this uh, old grandfather figure with the walking stick, and you're doing something a bit stupid, and he stops, and he maybe points his stick at you and smiles and says something wise, and then your life has changed forever. And <laughs> And he walks off, you know. And even with a great teacher like that, it doesn't. It, it's not like that, you know. Um, it, it's a lot harder work. And um, so I wanted to give, you know, a lot more context and, and, and background and, and to the whole monastic training, uh, rather than that kind of um, highlights package that you know sometimes you get in the, uh, some of the books. I have a question, because um, I read that you, you mentioned that you've been practicing since 1970 and uh, you were born in 1958, so these are men you've been practicing for about 42 years. So it's been quite a long journey, uh, especially being in Asia alone. So for these 42 years of practice, how has the journey been? Um, has there ever been a point where we felt uh, a sense of loneliness away from the family? and practicing um, in solitary uh, 
style after the five years of Asa? Uh, how do you actually cope with those um, those years of, of solitary practice? And also, you mentioned very interestingly that there is no non practicing Buddhist, a Buddhist has to be practicing. So, is there perhaps one practice that you have to do every day that um, helps you to keep up with the faith and um, kind of improves your 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 uh, cultivation uh, of Buddhism? Um, yeah, okay. Um, I, my, my own life, I mean, I can't summarize 42 years um, so simply in this, this kind of forum. Um, but I, I, from the day that I arrived in the monastery, I can say I've never had a single moment where I, I ever considered leaving the monkhood or disrobing. Um, uh, I'm just so... Um, I, I feel blessed to be able to live this life and it, there's nothing that I've ever wanted to do in life that I can't do within the, the framework of, of a monk and all the things that I want to do most in life I can do um, most easily and most effectively as a monk so I'm, I'm a great champion of the monk's life <laughs> and um, uh, yeah and, I, and um, I, I always love my own company, and so I, 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 I love I, being alone. Um, lo loneliness has never been a, a problem for me. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I'm, I'm a very happy monk. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of daily practice, yes, to start the day with a period of meditation. A lot of people um, do try to meditate every day, but um, uh, they, they will often meditate before they go to bed, um, which is okay. I mean, it, it's, it, it's good just to let go of the stress of stresses and strains, and, you, and it's better than taking a sleeping pill. And you, but um, often, you know, it, it just sort of drifts into sleepiness and. Um, and there's not, it's rarely people can maintain a very, uh, a sense that meditating before going to bed is, leads to great perceivable progress. It's, um, <clears throat> um, so I, I'm not saying not to do that, and I think it's a, it's a really good thing to do last thing at night, but the most important thing is to meditate first thing in the morning. If you meditate at night, even if you have a kind of clear meditation, you wake up in the morning and it's like a new chapter of your life, you know, so you don't see any, any results or not any clear results. You can say, well, this is happening because of what happened last night. Whereas if you meditate in the morning and you, you keep a close um, watch on your mental states throughout the day, you begin to observe, yes, if I meditate in the morning, I feel there's a lot more patience, a lot more mindfulness, uh, a lot easier to let go of things, don't get so stressed out. And that's when you really begin to see, yeah, this is, this is a really important part of my life. It's really like, because you're, you're seeing the, the effects in your daily life. And, and that's why it's, it's... Also, of course, when you're meditating first thing in the morning, your mind is relatively clear. And, uh, and, and if you've slept sufficiently, um, you know, you, you can develop good, uh, good meditation and clear meditation at that time. Um, so, the, so we talk about formal meditation and informal meditation. So sitting and walking is the formal meditation and being mindful and developing right effort throughout the day is the informal meditation. And these two things affect each other. So you'll notice that um, if you meditate in the morning, to say it's that much easier to sustain mindfulness and awareness throughout the day. And by the same token, if you are mindful throughout the day, when you do have time to sit and walk, then it's that much easier to, to calm the mind and to free the mind of hindrances. So these two things work together and influence each other. Thank you, Ajahn, for the talk.
So I would like to ask a question that pertains to studying or working. So I find it the hardest to maintain a mindfulness uh, during studying periods because my mind is just running wild trying to solve various problems or to start with more information into my head. And um, I mean this will apply to work as well. So um, what advice do you have for maintaining mindfulness during work? Well, the basic um, mindfulness practice in daily life <clears throat> um, is keeping the precepts. The precepts are the, your, your basic safety net. Um, as long as you're mindful of your precepts and not breaking precepts, then even if you lose mindfulness, it's, it's not a disaster. It's something you can do about it. But if you lose mindfulness of your precepts and um, break any precept, then there are serious consequences that, that will arise and, um, and there will be real obstacles to progress in Dhamma. So um, in times of, of study, um, things where you really have to give rein to that, that um, part of your brain, um, then sometimes you just have to accept that you know, you're not going to be totally peaceful and you don't want to be peaceful at that time. Um, but what you do want is to be mindful and to prevent unwholesome dhammas from arising. So, you know, thinking and, and working on theories and, and testing formulas, that's okay, that's not a big problem. But if you're fear and anxiety um, about um, the results of your studies um, and these various kinds of unwholesome dhammas, those are the problems. So if you can protect your mind from them, it's helpful. Also, very mundane um, uh, point is like um, time management um, and um, uh, according the the right amount of time to things and having regular breaks and uh, if you're working um, for over a long period then to stop um, at a regular maybe setting or alarm clock and just have like one or two or three minutes just watching your breath or sometimes to, um, some yoga posture something just uh, a little bit more physical but just to re-establish your mindfulness at regular intervals. Um, but like, like to, to um, beware of what we call vipawa danha, you know, it's like you have a commitment to this kind of study at the moment. Um, and, um, you know, if your mind's conflicted that, you know, uh, you want to do this, you love doing this, but at the same time you don't want to feel like this, you know, this is creating unnecessary problems. Yeah, this is the nature of it. You know, when you're working on in this kind of work, there's this kind of uh, mental activity going on. Um, and it's not still, but as long as it's not um, leading you to com be completely lost or to be acting or speaking or thinking in ways that are harmful to yourself or others, it's workable. It's not a. It won't be a major obstacle. But you can't expect that kind of thinking to be peaceful. It's just. It's just not. Yeah. Ajahn, thank you for your sharing. I have one question. In, uh, as it regards to motivation, um, I realize that in times when I have, uh, you know, when I feel spiritually inspired in one day, uh, especially on Saturday, because that's where all my Dhamma activities are in, and then the next day I feel completely exhausted, completely demotivated, and not even really wanting to fulfill my basic um, obligations as being a student, or being a daughter, etc. So, um, it has been happening for about half a year, um, and I, I really cannot reconcile, you know, like, swinging between these two extremes. Uh, yeah, and I, I do understand the, the concept of as in, as in, there is impermanence, but I still feel um, a lot of dukkha coming from this 
swing in between being fully made or fully motivated to live my life, to realize my potential, and the next day, gosh, I just can't take life anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, so, so uh, again, <clears throat> the, um, this, this point of vipawa tanha, you know, it's not so much what you're doing as not wanting it to be like this or wanting it to be some other way than it is right now. So that's um, the direct um, thing that you need to work on. So in the, in the Dhamma talk, you know, I'm saying um, that uh, there are no things that force you to feel depressed or low or down. Uh, there are there are triggers and there are th things that will um, uh, will encourage you to to feel that way if you're not mindful. So at the moment you're uh, maybe you're having to um, having some real joy and and, and um, uh, from the Dhamma practices on, and then you want to hold on to those, but you're living a life where you just can't because the causes and conditions for those kind of mental states are not um, are not accessible in the in the kind of life that you're living right now. So you have to make peace with that, um, and um, you have to. Also, uh, as I suggested to the other person, uh, just uh, the other questioner, uh, like very important first thing in the morning uh, to be very diligent about your uh, formal sitting meditation because that's clarifying the mind and calming the mind um, and a lot of these um, mental states just don't arise when you, when you have this uh, starting off the day in a very wholesome way. But also, um, sit and, and just give some thought, as wise reflection, ways about why um, what you're doing right now is useful and valuable and, and worthy of commitment. So if you're uh, a medical student, then you're creating the causes and conditions to uh, reduce um, and eliminate the suffering of many um, fellow human beings in the future. And that's uh, a, what, you know, when we talk about right livelihood in the world, how many, how many livelihoods are there in which the, the livelihood itself is wholesome? You know, how many people can lead a wholesome life, uh, wholesome life and do good things as business people in the commercial field? But, you know, apart from, say, uh, doctors, nurses, teachers, social workers, so few people can have a leader life in which the work itself is something that uh, is so useful and, and meaningful, not just to yourself, to many other people. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing to, to be able to have this opportunity to, to train as a doctor. So this is the way to talk to yourself. Yeah. Oh, it's, so, it's tough, it's like medical training, it's so hard, you know, it's, it is really um, over many, many years, so, so much hard work. But remember why you, why you decided to do it in the first place. Um, and look up, and when you think of um, doctors that, um, senior doctors and professors and people that you look up to, um, and that you're on the path to following in their footsteps. So th this, is, this is also Dhamma practice finding skillful means of dealing with negative emotions. It's not, I can't practice because I feel like this. This is the practice right now. This is the learning. So these are the kind of emotions that are coming up right now. How do I deal with this? You know, what, how can I reframe my attitude and my, my thinking about this in such a way that it's not dragging me down, um, but, it's some, but it's actually um, contributing or um, in harmony with my spiritual goals? Uh, Namo Buddhaya Namde. Uh, firstly, I would like to apologize for vocal in this English. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I have skin problem actually, uh, very sensitive skin, but I love to join the meditation retreat. Every time I join the uh, longer meditation retreat, uh, my face becomes lots of people stop itchy and then stop come to their legs and then I start to scare. 
I, I, I start to think it's not suits me this kind of life, you know. But I really love to join the retreat, some Bante or some Menchi in Thailand. Mm. Ask me to stay longer for a few months. But in my heart, the fears come that the itchiness will spread all over, you know, from face to neck. And then, how to overcome this? <coughs> Well, well, first of all, um, you know, recognizing um, anxiety and fear as anxiety and fear. These are mental states that arise. They're not who you are. They're visitors. Okay. Um, so um, the moment we think something might happen, and then the more we think that something might happen, becomes something, yeah, it really may happen, and then the more you think it's going to happen. You know, so the more you think about something, the more real it becomes, and the more likely it becomes, um, and um, we create all this suffering for ourselves. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure about the, the condition in your face, but um, often these kinds of um, condition are coming from the mental state rather than from the physical um, health. And so sometimes there is a lot of stress or maybe trying too hard or forcing too hard or, or bring... So when we get stressed out, people have different physical reactions. Um, and, and, and skin problems are often cause of stress, uh, caused by stress. So, um, I'm, un I'm not sure if the particular kind of um, effort that you're putting in when you go on this retreat is maybe too much pushing and, and forcing yourself, and then it's your body is saying, too much, too much, you know. Um, so, maybe it's uh, worth trying just a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more maybe metta meditation, loving-kindness meditation, and I think you may find that that, that is, uh, helps with the condition. But even so, you see, in, in monasteries, generally, we don't have mirrors. So this is a good, don't look in the mirror when you're in the monastery, and then you don't have to worry. Because nobody, the whole idea is, you don't have to be attractive, you don't have, you can have spots in a monastery, and nobody cares, okay? <laughs> So it's wonderful, you know, what the best possible place to have a skin condition in the monastery, you know. And people are obviously they're concerned if, uh, and there are medicines available and, and, and you can treat it. But I, I think my guess is that this is coming from, from some stress that you're feeling um, in the monastery rather than uh, because of Buddhist training. Ajahn. I'd like to know uh, when is the proper time to do chanting before meditation or after meditation, and what type of body chanting do we have to chant if we have time? Yes, so, so like in the Buddhist practice, it's like, uh, or in the curriculum, like uh, meditation is like the compulsory subject and, and, and chanting is like the elective um, so, you know, it's not, um, so some people, uh, the chanting, they really love the chanting and it brings up a lot of joy and, and, and they can be very calm and peaceful with that. And then those people should do a bit more chanting. Um, other people, they don't really feel uh, not very helpful in their practice and they still do a little bit less. but. Usually, uh, we chant before the meditation because when we, when we come to the meditation hall or meditation room straight from our normal life, usually quite a lot of things going on in our head. And if we just sit down straight away, you know, like it's the first few minutes or maybe, it's, or maybe more than that, it's just like house cleaning. You know, there's all this stuff going on in our head. But if we have this uh, intermediate practice, chanting, it, it, it's a way of just changing the, the mind and moving from the worldly mind 
to the more calm and focused mind. So there are, so your small activity, that you're chanting, you're using your voice and, and so on, but it's a way of calming the mind and preparing for meditation. So generally we, we, we chant before meditation, but there's no fixed rule about this because everyone's different. And if you like to sit first and meditate and then chant afterwards, that's fine. Is you, you have to see, try it out. What's it like when you chant before? What's it like when you chant after? And see which, which, is, which you enjoy. And this is the most important thing. Um, so hard to be consistent as a lay meditator and keep doing it every day and sometimes you're lazy, sometimes you don't feel so good, sometimes you... But this, you have to really try to keep it up. And the most important thing is you have to enjoy it. You have to look forward to it. You know, this is the time of the day that I love the most, like early in the morning when I'm just by myself. And, and, and really cultivate this sense. It's, it's my favorite time of the day. So if you chant, you know, and you feel, yeah, this is what makes me happy, that, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So before is okay, after is okay. Both is okay. Maybe the last two or three questions. Can I ask, um, how do you deal with friends who try to convert you <laughs> and then keep the friendship? Because they are like really good friends. I mean, not try to convert you, but you have differences in like beliefs. Kind of like yes. Methodism and evangelism. Um, yes, a long time since anyone tried to convert me, so I'm just trying to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I remember just that this is a story. Um, after I'd been in, in Thailand for six years, um, I returned to England to visit my family, and then I went to visit one of our branch monasteries um, and we caught a train from London and we, uh, we arrived um, in the local town near the monastery uh, quite late at night, about nine, ten o'clock at night. There was uh, three or four monks and we were walking along the road um, and suddenly this car um, parked and like three or four people came very quickly across the road towards us, you know, you think, oh, it's like, you know, what's going to happen? Um, and, um, and, and one of them came up to me and, and they were Christians. And he said, what do you believe in? And you know, six, six years as a Buddhist monk, I didn't have a good answer. I said, um, <laughs> Maybe ask him, he's a senior monk. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but so, yeah, so this, this is again related to my talk. It's not, it's not like about believing in things, okay? Um, but, um, you know, with peop in, in Buddhism, we, we have no idea, we have no concept that converting someone to be Buddhist is, is uh, a good thing to do. We have no, we don't want to do that. Uh, we have the respect for other religious traditions, but that's not how they look at us. Um, in those traditions, they believe that we're on the way to hell, and uh, they, out of compassion, they want they want to help us. So they they have they feel it's a good thing, and their and their duty and their responsibility to their religion to try to convert people um, so that you can go to heaven with them. Um, so one thing is just to recognize that they are coming from you know, the genuine concern for our well-being. But you also have to be firm sometimes. And you said, yeah, I understand um, what you're telling me and uh, I, I, I respect your, your belief, but I just don't believe this. And I'm, I'm a Buddhist and I'm happy to be a Buddhist and I'm not going to change. And I, I really um, don't need to hear it. I would like to ask you just to stop because you're wasting your time. You know, I, um, I'm happy to be your friend and I like your company, but you know, this, 
please, this is enough. Um, I really am not going to change my, uh, my religion. And, and so if some people ask you about, you know, this, uh, when people um, from other religious tradition, you know, one thing I ask somebody is like, um, what is it? I, I'm assuming that you know that you don't think you're a perfect Christian or a perfect Muslim. And say, no, of course not. So can you tell me what is it that prevents you from being the kind of Christian that you, you, you would like to be? Or what prevents you from being the kind of Muslim that you think you should be? And then usually people will say, yeah, well, you know, I, I get angry sometimes and I, I lose my temper or sometimes I'm very jealous and, and uh, I have unvirtuous thoughts and these things. Yeah, do you know, in Buddhism, we have a lot of very good techniques for, <laughs> for dealing with negative emotions. And, and you can borrow these, you know, you don't have to be a Buddhist to make use of these things. Um, and, and so it's not like a sneaky way to convert somebody, okay? But this is, for me, this is what, as Buddhists, um, you see, the, f f in my view, the, the weakness of these other traditions is they have very high ideals, uh, but no practical means of bridging the gap between where you are now and how you're supposed to be. And so people feel guilty and feel, you know, insecure. Um, and we can say, like, uh, as Buddhists, this is something we can give to people of other religious traditions. We can give them some uh, Buddhist techniques to enable them to be better Christians and enable them to be better Muslims. Um, not because we want them to be Buddhists, but because we, we don't have a copyright on these, these teachings, but they are effective and they, they are helpful and maybe that you can share something uh, with others. Um, but sometimes I think as Buddhists we're too like passive and too, um, you know, too easily uh, like steamrolled by, you know, these people is like, you know, got... Because this is the thing about that kind of, you know, when people have this faith and belief in books, they become very strong you know, but it's, 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 it's a strength which is rather rigid, you know, and it means that, um, you know, you have to keep away from people who have other ideas and you have to just believe and don't doubt. So in those religions, doubt is the number one enemy, you know, uh, everyone's afraid of doubt. But in Buddhism, we're, we look at doubt and we understand doubt and we're encouraged to ask questions and it's not considered a sinful or disrespectful but it's part of our duty as Buddhists to keep asking questions and looking at things and so one of the, so what I'm saying is that when people try to convert you in a way it's a good thing because it forces you to really what is it why why am I a Buddhist rather than a Christian or how, what can I say is, no, it's, I'm not saying for you, but for me, uh, Buddhism gives me this and this and this, and, and this is so important in my life, and I would never want to give this up. So you have to be a little bit more, it's not just sort of loyalty to the name of Buddhism, but you have to be very clear and precise about what is it exactly in Buddhism that is not available in other religions. Not to say we're better than them, but to say this is why you know, I would never give up my my Buddhist religion. Good evening, Tanaji. I'm not sure how to phrase this, but um, um, maybe to describe the, the issue here. Um, there's a struggle, um, the sense of like uh, fear, anxiety, stress, um, and a lot of self doubt in 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 our own practice. Like, when I'm facing stress, anxiety, you know, they are. Uh, but strangely, um, whenever I would go to a, like a, maybe a retreat or a meditation, like a place where um, you can just put everything outside there, and you come into this place where 
um, you know, you don't have to deal with it anymore, the, the issues there. Mm. Then there is a lot of calm and um, just, you know, at ease. So the thing is, um, I just mentioned about how we should do the training. But uh, the struggle here is that the training, you know, to really learn to be steady and composed even in the face of adversity or in the face of very uh, major challenges, very stressful times, um, it's so hard. Mm. And then I came to a point where I realized that it's not about rationalizing it, you know, because um, Perhaps for, for a person who is more of a rational thinker, uh, sometimes you tend to just think through it and try and rationalize it. But it, it seems that actually that's, that's, that, that doesn't take the, the stress and the anxiety and the fear off. You know, it, 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 in fact, in fact um, once that rationality is not there, once the emotion is actually stronger and it takes over, the, the stress and the fear and anxiety is like, whoa, you know. So, um, so there's actually a struggle here. Like, um, unless I'm in a context or a place where I can say, oh, just let everything be and not, not think, not uh, deal with it. And then there is that calm. But otherwise, when you have to face it, you have to deal with it. So how do we take that training into the the the, you know, the, the real when, when we are really facing it? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think that when we, we when we go on if you go on retreats and time in monasteries, just time to like forget everything and get away from it and just put all that stress away. I I sympathise and sometimes. Um, that can be a lifesaver, but long term, it's not such a good way, um, it, and because it, it means when you go back to it, it's even worse, you know. Um, and um, you're, you're constantly looking as this is something, this is unbearable, which I, you know, I have to get away from every now and again just so that I can survive. Um, whereas um, I believe that. Often in stressful situations, there are there are some things which are you know, are just given. They're just part of that particular way of life, um, or that particular profession and livelihood and and life situation. But there's also a certain element that we add to it by the way we think about things, the way we approach them, and our our, um, our own um, mental states. Um, and and this is what the work is, has to be done, looking here in the way in which you're unnecessarily contributing to the stress, um, rather than merely reacting to a stressful situation. But if you find that the, um, the given, the unchanging uh, stressful elements are so strong, um, then I would suggest that you make some changes in your life and look for a less stressful uh, way of living in the world um, because it's, um, it's maybe it's just too much for you and you need a, um, to reduce the, the amount of um, stresses uh, or things encouraging stress in your life. So it's not just a matter of you know getting away from it and calming your mind and then coming back. You know this just goes around and around and never come to an end. You, you need to, to be coming to the, the sources of it. Um, so, uh, trying to an you have this analytical mind, then turn that analytical mind on the stress itself. Like, is the stress constant? Um, sometimes you feel more stressed than other times. So, what is it that conditions this increase in stress and the decrease in stress? What are they internal factors or factors in the situation and the people around you? Um, what are the, the, the thoughts and the beliefs and the expectations and the desires and the fears 
which affect the intensity of the stress. So this is the kind of work, this is the kind of analysis that, that needs to take, take place. Also on a practical level, in every day, even if you're leading a very busy life, there are always short periods of time when you don't have to be thinking about things. So it might be standing in a lift, um, or walking from a building to a car, a car to a building, walking from one room to another room. And so there are many short periods of time, one minute, two minutes, and those are the times you re need to reclaim those minutes and just and just relax the body, uh, do this body sweep from the head down to the feet, just relax, take some deep breaths, re-establish your mindfulness. So throughout the day, if you are every hour or so, you're just relaxing the body, stabilizing the mind, bringing the mind back to the breath, then you prevent this drip, drip, drip of stress throughout the day from uh, becoming uh, too strong. So th this is an example of, of something that you can do in your daily life. Um, may I just ask a follow-up question? Uh, because this morning, Ajahn mentioned something about um, you can't control what you cannot control. Yeah. And if you try to do that, it actually creates a lot of stress. Yeah. So that's one, one, there's awareness that there's this, sometimes you still do this, like, the, the, the idea that uh, there are things that you, you need to have some control over, but yet you have no control. And uh, that actually presents a lot of uh, stressful situations to, you know, to really deal with such situations. So, um, I mean, as, as practitioners, right, could we just acknowledge, is it good enough to just acknowledge that, you know, this is really beyond control, and yeah. you just have to face it the best way that we can. Yes, absolutely. Um, and maybe it's not as bad as you think, um, it's not sure. So, um, the Ajahn Chah would often talk about planting a tree. So you plant a fruit tree, so you choose, the, you have the control, you choose where you're going to plant it, and you, um, and you water it, and you take care of it, and you protect it from bugs. So these are all the things that you can do. But whether that, that tree grows fast, or it grows slow, or the fruits are bitter or sweet, there's, you cannot control that. That's the nature of, of things. So the wise person recognizes in what areas can I exert some control, and then I exert the control, and then you let go of everything else. And you say, learn to let go of the results of your actions and put the effort into the quality of the actions. Um, so, um, my mother is, I often criticize my mother in public forums, my, my mother is a champion Olympic standard warrior, okay? <laughs> And she'll worry about anything, you know. If she hasn't got anything to worry about, she'll find something, okay. So it, it's her life. So I've, I've tried over the years so many different ways of um, uh, uh, persuading her to uh, give up her worry. But um, I probably the most successful is not a Buddhist, uh, necessarily a, a Buddhist way, but I'm going to share it with you. Um, and it's sing a song, okay? And this is song is Kesara. Do you know this song? <laughs> yeah. So whenever you get really stressed out, just say, Kesara, Sara, whatever will be, will be. Yeah. So you, you try sing that song to yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, forest tradition has a high emphasis on Pome uh, Ajahn, Kuba Ajahn. So, Ajahn, Ajahn Chah's Plato is one of the uh, early generation uh, master. But uh, 
in our time, many of these Pope uh, Ajahn or Bologna Park. Mm. So, what should we uh, look in a good teacher? So, you want to follow uh, in our time Pope Ajahn? Um, I think the the most important feature is you don't try and work how you know, don't get it like they say he's an error. No, no, somebody. So I heard something, he really know. He's in the inside. He says, actually, he's only a Sakitagami. <laughs> yeah? Well, I was at this monastery and I heard this monk said he was a Soto. You know, so, so this, uh, this kind of uh, gossip, you know, about monks and their attainments and I want the best, I want an Arahant teacher, only like platinum st standard. Um, <laughs> But um, it's not really um, the point, and you, you can't know it. And, and, and even monks who are arahants, it doesn't mean that the arahants are always the best teachers. You know, teaching ability and, and um, understanding of Dhamma don't always go together. And uh, sometimes um, great teachers um, attract some very, some very unpleasant people around them. You know, it's just people who just, I want to be close to the great master. And those kind of people can be really unpleasant sometimes. Um, so um, being close to great masters is not always so great. Um, so rather than getting caught up into this, is he at that level or is he not at that level, you come back to this very simple, um, uh, standard that the Buddha gave us for so many different of these kinds of questions in life is um, when you're receiving teachings from teacher over a period of time um, do you find oh, generally speaking that your defilements are becoming less and the wholesome dhammas are increasing that's, that's the gold standard. That's like the standard that you can be confident. Are you growing in the Dhamma because of studying and learning from this teacher? Um, is, your, is the amount of greed and hatred and delusion of these things feeling just a little bit less? Um, and that's what you should look to, to her teacher. And sometimes uh, it, it there, there are things that go on. It's almost like a chemical reaction. You know, you can, you can um, pay respects to some teachers, and you feel incredible admiration and, and recognition that this is somebody who's um, really realized the Dhamma, or you really have confidence. But you just feel indifferent. Um, and there are other teachers where you just feel this sense of connection um, and and. Um, and yes, this is kind of like a, um, a sympathetic chemical reaction that happens. And like I, I had this feeling with, with Ajahn Chah when I met him, so very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.